Uh oh. All right, we are on. We're on and running, or we're on and we're almost running. We are on. We are on. All right, good morning, everybody. Actually, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I guess we'll look at it that way. And I uh, hope everybody's doing okay. I'm actually not looking at the screen at the moment because I'm actually looking at the bloody registration. Um, uh, I hope everybody is doing okay. Uh, welcome to another one of the Wiser Training webinars. Um, and as the title implies, we are going to be talking about kids. It is, what in the world are your kids doing online today? I am extremely pleased, proud, kind of happy on this one to be uh, hanging out with some folks. I'm actually going to go basically from my right to the left on this one. Uh, we have uh, Alma Maria on here. We have Chris Hagnadi on here. We have Gabrielle on here. And we have David Schwarzberg on here. And I'm going to shut up for a minute. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Alma Maria, please, would you like to lead it away and just say hi and give us the background? Thanks, Chris. So my name is Alma. Um, and I am an educator and a recent JavaScript, po uh, JavaScript bootcamp survivor. And I've been teaching educational technologies for many years now. And I have become increasingly more passionate and more interested in uh, cybersecurity in the ed tech space. And that's why I'm here today. Awesome, thank you. Mr. Hagnati, sir. You're up next. Thank you. So I'm Chris Hadnagy. Um, I'm a hacker, I guess, maybe. I don't know. Something like that. I break stuff, maybe, every now and then. I'm a father, so I have definitely interesting kids. And I run um, a nonprofit called the Innocent Lives Foundation, where we work with law enforcement to help capture child predators. And part of that, of course, is educating parents and educators on how to properly monitor the situation so they can keep their kids safe from these kind of things. So I think I think that's why I'm here. Either that or I'm comedic relief. I'm not sure. <laughs> we could take the DEF CON stance. You do both the uh, the human side of things, the uh, the ILF side of things, and then we basically discuss whiskey for an entire evening. That that is true and it's it is noon, so we could have whiskey. That is actually very true. I like that yeah. concept and that yeah, idea. Yeah, five o'clock in the UK, so. Yeah, David, <laughs> sir. David, sir, you're up. Hey, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Dave Schwartzberg. I work in the security group at a major IT security company uh, professionally, but a lot of people may have heard of Hack for Kids. I'm president, one of the co-founders of Hack for Kids since 2014, also active in a variety of other different things with kids, like First Lego League, and uh, teaching them ethical hacking and fun things like that. So I guess I'm not the comic relief today because I don't think I'm that funny, but I'll do my best. Um, but yeah, it's it's great to be on this panel with all these folks that are highly knowledgeable. And it's great to see you again, Chris Roberts. It's been yeah, a while. thank you so. Appreciate it. Gabrielle, you're up. And let's face it, this is your initiative from the entire training series. So it's kind of awesome to have you front of shop today as opposed to hanging out in the back. I love it. Yeah, you know, this is uh, a topic that I'm very passionate about. I'm obviously, you know, I'm a father as well, and we run Wiser is a business that deals with security awareness. So it's natural for us to deal with and create a lot of content around kids. Hence, we, you know, we're doing this um, this webinar. And regardless, when we talk about security awareness in general today, with people working from home everything is intertwined, right? So like, there's no office anymore. Our kids are in our office to some degree. So I think it's important for many, many reasons beyond just safety, also in general, um, I think we should uh, look at what our kids are doing online. Yeah, no, awesome, fantastic. Um, good morning, everybody that's uh, joining us. Uh, as always, I'll be keeping an eye on questions. Um, I'll try and answer them as they come in, depending upon who's yakking away, and off we go from there. So let's um, uh, let's just really get down to it. We'll we'll start with the easy stuff. Um, you know, we've talked about internet safety, we've talked about the kids and stuff like that. You're all on here. I would love some general ideas and general intros to from each one of you on kind of what you see as the extent of the issue. Um, and on this one, actually, I am going to start with with Chris because of what he does with the Innocent Lives Foundation and just the general work on that one of the fingers in those by. So I'd be really interested in that side of it. 
and then we'll branch out to the educator side of it and, and obviously from David and stuff. So Chris, please leave this away. General, what's the extent of the problem? What are you seeing in this and, and that side of it? Set the scene for us. So let me apologize in advance for some of the things I'm about to say. Okay, they're gonna be clean, but these are difficult topics. Uh, in 2017, there was uh, 20 and a half million reported images of child sex abuse material to NCMEC. In 2018, there was 45.8 million. The problem is huge. 53% um, of this contains children under 10 years old. 2% of it contains children under two years old. 28% uh, of it is what we would call BSDM involving children. 84% um, of that is new content and 91% of that is video. So actually someone video recorded this. Uh, it's estimated about nine children per minute are abused here in the USA, um, just in this country. The problem is huge. And when COVID kicked off, uh, there was at least uh, what they're estimating to be a 200% a, a, a increase in child abuse because now what would happen is children would go to school and educators would see a child who would show the signs of abuse and report it. That's not happening. The children aren't going to school. They're at home with their abusers. So the reports, uh, the reported incidents are down, but the effect of very dangerous child abuse is up. So I don't wanna dominate the time because it's pretty depressing, but the problem is huge, right? And, and a lot of it starts from um, being on the internet unsupervised, being on the internet without any controls, being on the internet where parents don't know how to monitor. Those kids get themselves into some dangerous situations chatting with people that are nefarious, and then that turns into what's called sex exploitation or other things like that that could that can result in in these horrible statistics occurring and really young ages too so we're not just you know we're not just talking about teenagers preteens and even younger now yeah that's the i mean it's I think that for me is is one of the reasons that uh, you know doing this kind of thing because I mean yeah. My daughter, Mo, is now 16 going on 17. The first time they started talking about this stuff in school was when she hit high school, which was you know two yeah. years ago. They hand you a Chromebook. They say, welcome to the online world. And you're like, yeah. you've been online for the last five, six, seven freaking years. Yes, I know we have a duty to do it. But it's like, okay, you know, that to me is the conversation with the educator, which, I mean, Alma, please give me some thoughts on this one again. What are you, from the education standpoint, again, extend to the problem, some thoughts on this one as well? Well, to speak a little bit to what uh, Chris just talked about, that the educators are kind of like a, I don't know the right word is a stopgap. They're like these, they, they can serve a role as, as detectors. Um, I think they can also do that in the cyberspace in the sense that educators need to take the responsibility into their own hands because unfortunately, from my experience, schools are still very, and I'm, when I say schools, I mean K through 12 schools, are really ill-equipped to deal with uh, cybersecurity issues. We have some initiatives um, that are trying to provide information and resources to educators in particular to help educate students to be better digital citizens. But I still think that there's so much more work to be done when cybersecurity is concerned, particularly right now. You know, I think it was uh, Gabriel who said, that our, the kids are in our office. Well, actually, we're in their schools now because they are, they are, they're going to school, you know, and they might be sitting right next to us on the iPad taking a class or doing their homework on Seesaw or they're, they're having their class through Zoom or through Google Meet and everything has left over. So the educators can begin by arming themselves and knowing what the, what, what issues they need to be aware of around how to keep themselves as educators on the internet safe. And then from there, they can understand how to keep their students safe on the internet. And there's, of course, many issues to cover. In particular, this, this safety around child exploitation is extremely concerning. And I think that educators can definitely begin by knowing that the problem exists. So of course, visiting um, Chris's website 
And secondly, um, using resources like Common Sense Media. Um, they, they give you information on how to teach digital citizenship and you can incorporate it into essentially any class at any level. Right. So, I mean, it's, you know, when you start looking at that from, I mean, the schoolroom standpoint, I mean, David, we, so we had a kind of a very brief talk about this stuff yesterday. David, I'd be interested in your side on this one, because again, it, it kind of crosses those boundaries between the education stuff, especially what you're doing on the scouting side of the world. You know, we obviously talked about the predatory stuff. We talked about the, the child-related material. What other things are you guys seeing? On the bullying, the predators, and that side of things. Yeah, so... The bullying is the cyber bullying more specifically because when you say bullying that mo means more in person but yeah, the cyber point. bullying obviously is there it's something that's been increasing the moment other kids have learned how to be anonymous on the internet uh, and and cyber bullying can come in different facets or forms it, it doesn't just mean that someone is being shamed it could just be any way of affecting someone's feelings or uh, some of the terms is you know you have the bully right there they're the person that's actively creating the, the situation, but then you have like an audience and the bully is really feeding the audience to make themselves feel better or to protect their own feelings or whatever their, their reasons are. Um, so, you know, that's something that I know schools are aware of. I know schools are teaching this to kids. I know there's um, the IC Squared Foundation that started Safe and Secure Online and then they've, they've kind of spun it into more of a, a different theme with Garfield. But that's something that we've been teaching at Hack for Kids every event, just in case there's something that we cover that the schools didn't, yeah, there's a lot of overlap, uh, but I think it's also important that they hear it because hearing it once a year is not enough. Hearing it once a month might be, hopefully, but even kids that are like, you know, when they're around 14, they're like, oh my God, I've been hearing this since I was eight years old. Uh, somehow they still fall into the trap. I'm a parent of three kids. I watch uh, my kids interact with their friends. Sometimes they say things that are not that nice. I have to remind them and vice versa. Sometimes other kids are saying mean things to them. And what is, what is the natural reaction to get even, to, to try to win? So I'm trying to teach them you win by walking away. You win by closing the laptop or you win by ignoring them or just saying, I'm going to report you. They don't want to lose their account. So there's their incentive to be a little nicer. You know, um, character counts and kindness is important. So that's some of the stuff from kind of the cyberbullying aspect. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but the other things that I see is, I mean, it just happened last weekend. I have uh, one of my wife's friends telling me their kid wants to learn to hack. How can I teach them? It's like, I don't have enough time to teach, sit down with every kid and teach them how to hack. And that's why there's different kinds of programming. There's tons of resources on the internet. There's events, there's conferences. You've mentioned uh, roots before also at DEF CON and then there's Hack for Kids and there's all these other ways of, of educating these kids but I always caution parents that sometimes these these programs come with a high price so they assume it's a higher quality and that's not always the case so don't look at the price as a measurement of quality like you do with your automobile but inspect the content go to people that you might know who are specialists and say hey what do you think of this or look at the online reviews get some third-party opinion uh, yeah. And that's kind of it. But one one last funny story is the parents and the kids they wanna they wanna learn these things, right? In, in some cases, and I've had a parent tell me, you know, my son got really mad at me the other day. I was like, why? Well, he said he wanted a Raspberry Pi. So I took him to the grocery store. Bless you, Alma. <laughs> Thank so, you. <laughs> so there's parents that are also looking for this education because their kids want the knowledge. They know it's something that would be good for them later on in their field or when they get into uh, either high school or college or you know professionally so let's have the so i kind of i mean you know i think we've set the ground we've definitely I and mean, it's interesting just listening to a couple of the comments that are coming in there's a lot of folks like hey we get the problem i'm like well congratulations not everybody does unfortunately there are definitely some people who understand the problem but i think there's a lot of people who, who haven't or don't fully understand you know we hand you know we hand our kids these devices and 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 then un, unfortunately in a lot of cases you know we're handing them i'm trying to think when i when, when my daughter first got one of these like 11 12 years old something like that and most of it is because you know there are a lot of other kids that had them in school from earlier ages and so we're handing these damn things off and we're not really giving any instructions or any thoughts or any monitoring and we're not really sitting down and talking to the kids like yes here little johnny have a bloody telephone and um you know and off they go so i'm i'm interested 
we will be talking about tech for everybody that's listening we're going to talk about some of the tech and some of the solutions but for those of us that have rugrats or those of us that interact with rugrats on a regular basis <laughs> i really want to have the conversation about do we monitor do we communicate or do we do both and then when does that bleed over when do we have those conversations gabrielle i'm going to actually put that at you for the moment because again we were talking a little bit about kids yesterday so if you guys mm -hmm. can give me like a minute or so and just give me some thoughts on like monitor communicate or or both and then if you are going to monitor how are you monitoring and what are you monitoring okay i'm gonna it's more than a minute but i'll stick to a minute i'll focus <laughs> so yeah the answer is both it's technology and not technology but i'll focus on the non-technology because a lot of parents are intimidated by technology they feel their kids are ahead of them in terms of technology and they really don't know what to do so i want to talk about you know the emotional aspect because kids are emotionally behind the parents maybe they're technology advanced but you know from emotional point of view they are behind and the same techniques the same type of attacks that work on adults whether it's, for example, something is too good to be true or something that tries to scare us to death. They work the same way when it comes to kids, but in a different context. So the attack is the same. We as parents can teach common sense to kids in general. We can say, look, if you get free V-Bucks or free stars or free anything that has to do with your game, it's probably a scam. Or if you get an email, a extortion email, somebody tries to scare you to death there's a time bomb ticking you have to take action now this is basically a scam so i think it's very important for parents to understand that they have a lot to teach their kids that has nothing to do with technology but more about how you're being communicated with over the internet whether it's you know somebody chatting with you and asking for something that doesn't make sense or scares you or they have an offer for you all of those things are things that just parents can teach today and they have nothing to do with technology. So it makes sense. Again, David, you know, again, we talked a little bit about this yesterday about the education standpoint versus the monitoring standpoint. And I mean, I know what I did with Mo. I mean, I took time with Morgan. I'm like, you know, I'm literally handing you this device. She luckily knows what I do for a living. I'm like, you know, you know what I do for a living. You know what I'm capable of. I would rather teach you, educate you, help you understand what's good and what's not so good on the internet, and the questions to ask, the things to think about, how to deal with it. I mean, there's so much we want to do with that. What kind of a safety net do we put in place versus how much freedom? And then does that change with age? And David, give me some thoughts on that one. So I guess uh, parents of geeky kids that are geeky parents are probably not the best example to go to for some of these things. Cause like you said, like my youngest kid, he was two and he had an old iPhone, Wi-Fi only, and he couldn't read, but he could tap the pattern to unlock the iPhone. He could go right into the apps he wanted. He recognized the pictures and the colors and the symbols of the icons. He couldn't read the names of the apps. And he knew to go into the photo gallery to look through photos and use the camera. Couldn't read. Um, but we would teach them over time. So I, I guess we could share this advice with non-technical or non-geeky parents that, you know, I say you should always start them as early as you can, but also with caution and also with preparedness. You're preparing the kids that as they grow into the technology, the rules around the technology will change. Also, you're supposed to evolve with that too. If you think you're gonna remain stagnant, then you should probably go live in a cabin somewhere in the woods because the, the technology will continue to change and you have to keep up with it. So kind of one of the things, right, Chris? So um, as they get older, you can have a contract a parental and kid internet or t technology usage contract. That contract, there's tons of them on the internet that are samples. You, you leave the stuff in that works for your family, you take the stuff out that doesn't. The most important thing that you need to do is define the usage, uh, when they could use it, what type of technology, and what are the consequences when they violate the agreed upon rules. So treat it just like a legal binding contract. They both have to sign it or both parents and one kid, but two parties have to sign the contract 
and and the parents can keep a copy. I think both copy uh, parties should keep a copy. So if there's a violation, you kind of say, hey, look, you agreed to this, you, you know, you're going to lose your computer, you're going to lose your tablet, whatever it might be. And every year, renew that contract because things are going to change. Right, makes sense. Chris, give me your thoughts on this one because I mean, you obviously see both the sharp nasty and the, the the pretty awful end. Give me some thoughts on this if you don't mind. Yeah, I, I could soapbox on this for an hour, okay, just because I got some really strong opinions on this. But um, there's very little things that we would give to our children without us being involved. If a child said, I want to learn how to cook, you wouldn't say, okay, here's some knives, there's a stove, go do it. When they learn to drive, you don't say, here's a car, go do it. When they learn to swim, you don't say, there's a body of water, jump in. A parent is involved in every aspect of their child's life as they learn new skills. I don't completely understand why parents feel giving them the most dangerous thing on the planet does not require <laughs> parental involvement. So I'm on the camp of you have to communicate age appropriate communication, right? When my daughter's five or six, I don't want to sit down and say, hey, honey, you know, 48% of the kids on the internet are going to be sexually abused. That's horrible to tell your five-year-old that, right? right? So at five years old, I need to maybe tell her, look, if some if somebody you don't know pings you on the internet, I need you to come run and tell me, and, and dad will take care of it, right? At the same time, I need to be monitoring this device, but I need to be monitoring it in a way, in my, this is my opinion now, I never covertly monitored my daughter's device. Right. Just like I didn't sit in the trunk of my car when I was teaching her to drive and I didn't put a webcam in her bedroom creepily, right? I didn't do yeah. any of those things. It was all, it was, hey, honey, here's what dad's going to do. I'm going to monitor this device because my job is to protect you. But you're going to have the freedom to talk to your friends. You're going to have the freedom to say, I hate dad today and I'm not going to approach you about that. You can do all those things. Because I want you to feel that you have your emotional space. But at the same time, if I see Joe123 texting you, and I'm like, hey, who's this Joe character? Right. And if you get nervous and you start stuttering and you're like, I don't know, or uh, you, you don't have a good answer, I'm going to start looking into Joe123, right? And then we're going to talk about that. And I'm going to have the right to shut him off or shut him down. So monitoring to me is just, you wouldn't give the, I wouldn't give my daughter the keys to the car and say, go learn to drive. I wouldn't say there's a swimming pool, go learn to swim. And I wouldn't put her on a bicycle and say, learn how to ride a bike. I, all those things, I would stay involved. So, um, but age appropriate. When she's 16, I also wouldn't keep training wheels on her car, yeah. uh, on, on, her, on her bike, right? I wouldn't keep training yeah. wheels on her bike. I wouldn't make her wear the floaties swimming when she's 16. So as the child grows, you got to give them more freedom. you got to give them more trust. I love the idea, Dave's idea of having a contract because yeah. consequences are important. Right. If you don't sit your child down and say, OK, here's the deal. Here's my rules of the house. I don't care if all your friends can go do X, Y and Z. My rules are here are my rules and you live in my home. So here's the rules. And if you break these rules, here are the things that will occur. And they have to be reasonable. It can't be like, hey, you break rule the first time you get no phone for a year. I mean, that's ridiculous. Right. you got to be a reasonable parent. We're going to sit right. down and talk about this. We're going to have this conversation and open, calm communication is the best way to get through to your kids. If, if it's threats, if it's like, look, if you do this, you are dead. Like you are going to be grounded forever. You're never going to see your friends again. Like that is the worst way you can communicate to your kids. They're just going to, they're not going to listen to you. They're going to go to their friends for advice. So I'm into communication and I'm into monitoring and I'm into all of it at an age appropriate level. Yeah. I had a really good talk. Morgan and I were talking about this webinar last week. And we had the conversation about monitoring, and it was really interesting because, again, you know, she's 16 going on 17. I mean, she's got friends, and she's talking about all sorts of stuff on the internet. And I'm fine with it because, for the last countless number of years, we've had those conversations. But if we hadn't had those conversations, I mean, I was talking to her, I'm like, so what would you do now if I put monitoring devices on your device? What would you do now if I put a monitoring system on your device? She and she's like, I'd be pissed. She's like, you're invading my privacy, you're doing this. You're, and I'm like, good, I want to hear that. I said, but what would you have done if? And so we, we had all these scenarios, and it was an amazing conversation. But again, my concern and my worry is how many parents and guardians are set up to have those conversations. And how the heck do we, from a community standpoint and from an educator standpoint, help the parents, help the educators actually have these conversations. I 
and we'll talk about it in a minute, just the fractured amount of data out there. I mean, Alma, give me your thoughts on this one, the communication monitoring stuff, or a similar kind of comments, similar kind of thoughts to these guys are having. Well, David brought up a really good point about the contract. Those also exist in the school setting. They're actually um, um, also some templates on the internet of like the digital citizenship contract. Um, as a technology educator, you should have your like set of rules or your class code of conduct or your class contract that each student is responsible for signing. Um, it also very much depends on the school. You could even have that if the school where your kids are enrolled, they give them the one-to-one -one device. They actually are going to have to sign contracts, and you as our legal guardians are probably going to have to sign contracts too. So it's just really good practice to put this um, code of conduct and uh, the, the use of technology in with that information and make sure that parents and students are reading it from the the uh, ed, the educational administration side. Um, and, and something else that I was thinking about as David, uh, as David and, and Chris were talking, um, there these are just really good parenting practices that overlap with educational practices. And just like when we talk in big picture, um, it takes a, what's that expression? It takes a village to raise a child. It's the same, it's the same when we talk about the use of the internet. Now, I know that parents often feel like it's safe giving their kid the cell phone because they're like, oh, it's like they're watching TV. You know, they put YouTube on and they just put it in front of them. But unless you're only going to let them use that phone for the five minutes that the, the video lasts, you're going to have to do, as, as Chris says, make it gradual and go up. And it's, it's always, it's also the same in the classroom. Um, Chromebooks for the lower primary, well, actually for lower primary, uh, kindergarten, lower primary, you have the iPads or the tablets that can have very, that can be extremely restrictive. A lot of monitoring put on there by the school. And then as you go up, you go to Chromebooks and you can. But as a parent, one thing that um, I recently enacted, and this came because um, I have a, um, a, what's the word I have, a TikToker. And he ha has become more and more active on TikTok. And a, an adult TikToker put a clickbaity something at the bottom of their profile. And it just said, if you want to be on my next TikTok, click here. And it was actually a link that it was actually a link that brought us to a service. Can can you hear me? Or we can I... break it up a little bit. So if you can just, yeah, um, if we can stay on the conversation that we were having about monitoring versus communication, you're breaking up a little bit, just a heads up. Okay. Well, coming to that, I think as a parent, you learn the best way to monitor also for your kid and how to communicate. And in my experience with my TikToker, we ended up this clicking on that link that signed my phone up for for this um, this app. We had to sit down so and have a conversation like around right that. So yeah, so we we actually we needed to sit down and talk about that and have more conversations around security and safety and the internet and these are things that right now with having kids going to school at home parents need to take on to themselves but it's also an issue that going back to school definitely need to as educators bring up again and in that in that particular conversation what i offered my son was the green lantern safe space so this is something that we do in schools and we can also do at home. Let your kids know that if somebody, some stranger starts messaging them on the internet, that you're not gonna freak out. You're not gonna be, as Chris said, an unreasonable parent. 
you're going to sit down and have a conversation with them and not punish them because someone has approached them or they click click on a clickbaity link that they maybe they they went into somewhere where they shouldn't be that they would they're not going to get ridiculously punished okay that makes sense yeah it makes a lot of sense so it's actually that brings up the, the good point and there's actually a bunch of questions on here from people where they're talking about you know we've talked about the appropriate monitoring and everything else i'm interested i don't want to get to a crazy technical level because there's so many areas we could go on this one um david i'm going to chuck this at you first because we had a conversation a little bit about this one about what kind of monitoring would we do i mean if we want to throw some some like some tech and some tool out there i think people would probably appreciate it some like tools and stuff that we use for monitoring so again go for it but again i want to remind everybody if we can keep this because we still got a bunch of stuff to go through and we got a lot of questions coming in so if we can keep the answers short and concise to like a minute or so let's go for it so david some thoughts on areas to monitor and technologies to use for monitoring so areas to monitor uh anything that would really be outbound anything outbound or north south traffic from your network right because then you kind of get a much better visibility on uh what's going on in your network so if they do click something that's a little click click baity ish and they get like command and control callbacks um something you know dropper or something's added under their their pc or their mac well now now you have better visibility and even stop it depending upon the tool you're using um mobile mobile device is a little trickier right because they could just switch from wi-fi to 5g 4g whatever they might be using so there are um, some tools on the different mobile os's that do give parents a bit more control and visibility where you could set time parameters you could set categories that might be allowed you could even do uh, allow or deny lists so you can get that granular in some cases is it going to solve every problem no but it can it can solve uh, certain gaps um i don't um like the tools i'm going to name now i i kind of use some of them but i don't use all of them just because my my employer provides some of these things for me and i just kind of have them in a home lab but if you use something like the open dns free service all right you don't get a lot of granularity but you do get protection protection against phishing attacks malware um and and some visibility from that standpoint then there's also things like the sophos home free um, home free home use for up to 10 10 devices so you get a nice web interface you could put it on grandma's computer that might be on the other side of the planet you'll still know if grandma got infected and still kind of help her from there so but again more visibility and some control of the different apps that might be running um, or applications on their device and what was the second half of your question chris um we talked about mobile lamps we talked about home apps i think that was part of it i mean you mentioned a couple of it i'm actually looking there's like consumer advice has got a whole bunch of like the top 10 apps for monitoring like young kids and they got like Bark, uh, WebWatch, uh, Net Nanny, Family Time, yeah. good old Nor Norton's. Is Norton's still a thing? I kind of like. They are. Kind of like... <laughs> they are. They're still around. <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you, but to that point is if somebody wants to put a piece of hardware in there, I know F Secure has got a pretty decent Wi Fi yeah. security appliance and, and that can do a lot of different things from protecting against malware and certain. Uh, websites that are categorized but again it's I think it's not a single solution it's multiple right. solutions layers of protection and then that that is the best solution and it'll provide some monitoring I'm kind of with you I've got a teenager I've got a tweenager and I've got a kid in his wonder bread years I, I different levels of monitoring for them all yeah Chris give me some thoughts on this one because obviously again you see a lot of this and Innocent Lives has got some stuff on it, as have a bunch of other sites. So give me some thoughts on the yeah. tools and tech, if you don't mind. I'll give you um, two really quick things. So first, on Innocent Lives, we have a really wonderful video on called Knowledge for Parents that taught, walks parents through some things like how do you protect your kids, how do you educate, um, how do you monitor. Then we have two guides, one for Android, one for iPhones, um, on how to set up monitoring uh, using the native OSs. Um, so I won't go into that. You can look on the site and I can even give you links if there's gonna be show notes for this after and I, we, we can link to those if you want. But the one thing I'll mention about some of the software that's out there, and I use it, like I use Custodio for a while, RPAC with my daughter, things like that. Um, apps like Custodio or Dear God Norton, if anyone wants to bloatware their computer and, and ruin their child's life, um, or Net Nanny, which isn't terrible, but here's the way they all work. Uh, to monitor your child, they create a VPN and uh, that all traffic then tunnels to that VPN 
um, which for non-tech people, that stands for virtual private network, and that allows you to monitor words, websites, and other things that you don't want your child to go to. It also gives you insight into things they're texting or saying or emailing. All of that's really useful, but here becomes one of the biggest problems with those apps, because Netflix is like the ultimate strictness on VPN usage. A lot of those monitoring apps disable your uh, child's ability to use Netflix on their device. Um, so if you allow them to do that, if you allow them to sit on their iPad and watch a Netflix show, um, that may be disabled. You'd have to just keep that in mind. Custodio, that was a big one. For iOS, Custodio, I could not get my daughter to use um, Netflix, so we ended up deep sixing that app, and it was the same with a few others. So you have to you have to just like do a little research before you put money into an app and, and decide what things you'll have to give up if you use it and what things you may need for that age um, appropriate monitoring right and then you can and then you can decide which tool is the best for you yeah no that makes a lot of sense gabrielle give me some thoughts on this one if you don't mind again same you're in the same boat you got the rug yeah. rats as well so first of all we set up a lot of material around that i won't start naming all the apps but uh we prepared uh, a resource and like a mini site for specifically for this webinar and we listed different apps and resources and all of that. So, you know, we'll share that later. Um, how to set up your Android, your iPhone, your, you know, your Mac, your Windows and all of that. Some of some of things are built in into the operating system. So, for example, with Microsoft or with Mac, you can set up or with Google, you can set up uh, family <laughs> groups and you really want to make um, your kids a dedicated account. So you can link it to yourself and then you can. Uh, have a better control on what they're doing. Other than that, something that, you know, David, we spoke about yesterday, which I thought was a really great idea, is get to know the apps your kids are using. Basically, download the apps and use them. You know, once you use the apps, you better understand the risk of these apps. I'm not suggesting, you know, upload TikTok videos unless that's your thing, but, you you know, browsing and, and, and getting a sense of uh, what's going on there will really give you a better insight to what your kid is exposed to and, and make a better decision if you want them to use that app or not. We also made uh, a resource page of the 10 risky apps, you know, but there's so many more. We just made, you know, 10 big ones and we created video that explain what they are and, you know, and what's risky about them. There are apps, for example, like Omegle, which is I think one of the worst, you know, it's like random <laughs> webcam chats. It's just, you know, unbelievable, you know, it's a split screen, you're at the bottom, and then somebody random shows up. And remember, you know, a lot of those teens and kids and kids are discovering their sexuality. So they're actually going in there for that purpose, unfortunately. And there is content there that is totally inappropriate. So you wouldn't know that unless like the easiest thing is just use these apps, you know, use them, get a sense of what your kid is exposed to. So um that's sort of you know. Other than that, like I said, there's a list of apps that we listed. Uh, hope it's useful for you know parents. Yeah, Chris has actually posted some stuff, so I just reposted it to everybody in the audience. Um, there's a video on there that's that's going to open people's eyes, and I think people's eyes need to be freaking opened on some of this. I support the innocent life stuff on there. Uh, to Gabrielle's point, there's definitely uh, there's a couple of resources I put in there as I've been ask, answering people's questions. I've actually been posting some of the resources and stuff out there. Um, all right, so I'm actually looking through some of these questions. There's some actually fantastic questions. Um, actually, this one I actually want to hit this one. Uh, Jill Parkley said a really good question, which is, you know, for parents, if we could break this down step by step by step how would we do this uh, and i think that's a really really interesting way to, again again for parents let, let's take ourselves out of this as technologists and go as a parent of a kid to, to chris's point i'm handing them basically one of the most powerful weapons on the planet which is people don't think about it that way um how would we break it down alma i'm gonna send this to you give some thoughts on this please and see if you can keep it short and concise into a minute well i think the first thing would be to break it down okay as an educator i would want to, as a parent i would go and i'd ask the schools how are you using technology with my kids what are they going to be using 
what are the devices they're going to be using, how are they going, how are they being controlled, how are they being monitored, um, what are the expectations around that. So I think as a parent, especially right now with the whole pandemic, how was or is uh, technology being used with your kids in an educational, from an educational point of view. So that would be, I think right now that's probably most kids are spending the most time on, on devices for educational reasons. So now that we're going into summer vacation, of course that's changed, but right, right now is a really good time for parents to look back and say, okay, so how was these technologies, how, how are my kids interfacing with these technologies? How do we know what, what were the policies or what are the practices set up around keeping them safe online from an, uh, a school perspective as a parent? I would first touch, you know, I'd go right to the school, to the, to the teacher okay. and ask them, how were kids being kept safe? All right, that's an appreciated one. Um... David, give me some thoughts. Take take the take the geek out of the answer for a second, which is I know for me it's a hell of a challenge. Take the geek out. Yeah. As a parent, how would you how if you're going to hand this to your kids now, how would you address it? What would you do as a parent to educate yourself and to to get yourself ready to basically hand a, a digital weapon? So again, that's really hard to take the geek out of the equation, but I'm going to do my best. It's really hard. I know. Uh, so just kind of. I'm going to put myself in the shoes of a parent that I know that's not technical. I'm not going to name them, but I'm just going to assume that, you know, I'm that person. Uh, the first thing I would let my kid know is that this is not a toy. This is a uh, powerful communication device. I want you to use it to communicate with me and your parents and your siblings and other family members, uh, especially the phone part. I, I would restrict um, them being able to call anyone. I would, you know, you can have like a, an allow list of people that can, send and receive calls. Uh, and then, again, this is younger and they have to, uh, yeah, you know, more freedom as they get older. Right. right, exactly. I would kind of explain it to them that, you know, this is, a, I have to go back to the contract because it would really be down to the usage, who who you're able to communicate with this with, what apps you're allowed to install, use the native controls to prevent them from installing things that are not age appropriate. Let them know, don't click on everything. The biggest problem is they just get click happy and, and that results in problems later on, with whatever that problem may be. Uh, I think from there, you just have to evolve it. Evolve it into, as you get older and you've demonstrated responsibility, that you're demonstrating that you're a resp responsible netizen, well, then I'm gonna give you more freedom. But at any time you break these rules and I find out about it, you're gonna have, like kind of what Chris Hadnagy was saying before, you're gonna have a reasonable, so just say time out of the device. Got it, understood. Chris, give me some thoughts on this one, if you don't mind, please, sir. I don't, and I can actually um, dumb dumb it down because I'm pretty stupid myself. So I think that's easy to take the the tech <laughs> out of it. Um, <laughs> there, there's a couple things that I found that were really useful f for me um, it, it, because I, I loved Gab Gabrielle's suggestion. I actually got a chuckle out of it in downloading apps because I've done that before, and that a very practice has made me ban certain apps in the house because like I download them and I'm like, oh my god, this is just porn. Like I don't understand why anyone's on this app and you know, and it's all preteen and teenage girls dancing with like half their clothes off. And I'm like, that app needs to go away and never be in my house again. Um, but I think what helped me the most is is actually asking my child saying, hey, can you show me how this works? And they'll make fun of you and they'll say, oh, my God, how can you be so dumb? I can't believe you don't know how to do a DM. You know how to send a message. My daughter will do this to me nonstop. And then. She'll bring it up at the dinner table about how dumb I am, and she had to show me how to do these 30 things. And wow, you're a world's leading hacker. You don't know how to send. And I let her ha let it happen because what I'm doing yeah. in the back end is I'm letting her teach me how she uses those apps, yeah. and then that tells me if there's a danger or if there's something there. Um, but I think the principle here's the principle that I always say to every parent who's non-technical that asks me is you can't expect your children to do something you're not doing. So you, you, you need to be the shining example of what you want your kids to do. If I want my child to not be on her phone 12 hours a day, I need to be able to show that I can actually put my phone down and not use it. If I want to show that I'm willing to get rid of apps or things that are dangerous to myself or my family, 
I need to be able to be that example that for her. Um, I need to be able to do the things that I want her to do. And if I can't teach myself or be an example, then how am I going to expect her to do that? So I think it's the best, the best way to protect them is to show lead by example and not just make a list of do not. It's easy. We do this at work, right? We say, don't click on fish. Don't click on this. Don't click on that. And we still see it's the biggest problem in the tech world today. Well, if it was easy enough to just tell people don't do these things and they would be fixed, well, we'd have no problems. And we'd all be billionaires sitting on our private islands right now doing this, right? But we can't. So the issue is we need to lead by example and then be, um, and, and then be a good example for our kids and, and leading the way on how to use these devices intelligently. So let's go to a couple of the, the we got, we got, we're coming up on towards, we got about 15 minutes left, 10, 15 minutes left. Um, I wanna hit two things. Uh, I wanna quickly run through, how do we know, how are we seeing what clues, what visual clues, what verbal and what non-verbal clues are we seeing when our parent, when our kids, or our parents, parents as well sometimes, when our kids are getting into situations that they can't deal with, and you know, it's it, each kid's different, but what kind of signs can we see? What are we doing, and how do we recognize that maybe we need to step in, ask questions, or ask them if they need help on that kind of stuff? When we've done that, and I only want to hit that for like five minutes, then I'm going to talk about okay, shit hits the fan, what do we do about it? Um, and that's a longer one on that one, so. Give me some thoughts, and again, short, sweet, into the bullet point shorts on kind of where, what are we looking for as an educator? What are you looking for in the classroom to see what's going on with the kids? Alma, some thoughts on that, please. Oh, this is a really good question, and I feel like it's something I could talk about a lot. Can do. Um, we got two minutes. So, <laughs> so first of all, you're okay. So, the first part of your question is. How do we how do we know if they're in trouble? Is that the the yes, first that's part of your that, question? Just, just hit that one. Yep. Okay, so as an educator, usually, and now I'm going to generalize. Usually, it's pretty obvious. I've had uh, kids scream where they get they get into a website they're not supposed to get into, right. and I don't you know it's like how did that get through the firewall? How did that get yep. through the controls? How the heck did that happen? But there it is. And there's always a kill switch, which is the, you know, the power button. You just turn it, just turn it off, turn off the regulator, turn it off. Then you need to do damage control as an educator. But so how do you know if the kids are in trouble? Usually it's pretty obvious. It's the ones that don't scream. It's the ones that are like, because it's like, oh, look, come over here. And then all of a sudden you've got 10 kids on top of one looking at their screen. Those are the, the the more trickier ones to detect, and I think that's where this uh, this from an educator and from a parent uh, perspective to build this zone of trust. This, like I said, I don't know if it cut out, but I offered my kids a, a Green Lantern safe space. So if something happens, if you're not quite sure, just you know, keep it, repetition is key in anything. Let them know if something happens if you're not quite sure come to me and i will listen i won't you know fly off the handle i won't start screaming i won't send you to the principal's office or i won't punish you let's talk let's talk about it i'm here to help i'm here to listen just you have to cultivate that space of safety and that is where you know maybe it's not going to be so obvious but if the kids are sure that they have that safe space they're going to come to you and they're going to tell you right no that makes sense and i that 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 hits the nail on the head which is you want the, it, this is not something when you hear oh my god i hit this site you don't want to, to your point you don't fly off the handle because that's the last time you're going to hear from the kid um david okay go ahead. yeah let me hit david on this one then gabrielle you hit it and then we'll start messing with the what happens next stuff yeah, so um, uh, verbal cues, I think uh, I agree with um, Alma. They're pretty obvious. I've got one kid that's like that. And what we tend to do is uh, kind of let it go because we found that sometimes it's not that big of a deal, but we try to talk about it later and when things are calmer and try to understand the situation to see if we need to take an action and get involved. Most of the time we don't. But I have an older kid who tends to do more things like isolationism. 
uh, he'll just stay in his room. And unless I go in there and just to check on him, I really don't know what's going on uh, from an emotional standpoint. There's also withdrawal. Like even when they're together or if we were having a meal or something, just very quiet and just try to understand. But, you know, hey, so what's going on? And, you know, nice questions, not what is wrong with you? We try to keep it calm, like Chris was saying before, and in a way to understand what's going on in their world. And, and surprisingly, these worlds are very, very important and very real to them, even though we consider them to be virtual. They are emotionally vested. So um, one of the things I'm teaching myself as a parent to get better at is to be more and more understanding in that area. It took me some time to get there, but I believe I'm pretty close now, but I'm still got a lot to learn. I think also in other things that I do is within scouting and, and the scouts is just like their social interactions. Like Alma was saying, one of them might see something and they all jump in and want to take a look at it. I mean, I will tell you, I have caught fifth graders watching porn. And what do I do? Most people are going to say, tell their parent. I'm like, if I tell their parent, now the kids are going to have trust issues with me and their parents. So I gave them a very appropriate lecture for that age. It was about five of them. And I was, I was, I was pretty appalled, but, and, 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 you know, sometimes you want to laugh, but you got to kind of keep uh, control. But anyway, yeah, I'll stop there. But yeah. it's, it depends on the individuals and the situation. Got it. Understood. Gabrielle, give me some thoughts. You said you wanted to have a quick one on this yeah. one. So, you know, I had a, a, a short post that I did about this the other day about for the kids, there's one world, not two worlds. You know, the world they live in is both virtual and physical. And basically the cues are the same. You know, if somebody is upset, if your kid is upset, insecure, it may just be a result of something that happened online. Don't assume that, you know, things look differently when they happen online versus when they happen offline, because a kid is a kid and they're emotionally, um, you know, impacted by it. So when something happens and they look bad for whatever reason, it's not just what happened at school, like it ha did something happen online? Um, you have to ask those questions because they just have one world and everything is intertwined, you know, online and offline for them is almost the same. And another thing that I would say is that you need to make them Again, I'm just piggybacking a little bit on what was said here before, but you have they have to be comfortable to talk to you. If they don't feel comfortable talking to you in general, then it will be also, you know, not comfortable talking to you about, you know, online activities. So you really want them to find from you different things. So you can initiate some talks, for example, about sexting, talk to them about it, and don't let them find about it from their friends or from the internet. Because if yeah. you're not going to talk to them about it, they're just going to figure it out themselves. So, you know, initiate these conversations so they know that they are comfortable to talk to you about it. That's basically it. Cool, all right. So I do wanna talk about, we, we're coming up, we got a little bit of time. I do wanna talk about the, the what happens when, because it is something that's gonna happen and we have it in our industry. It's not the, it's not if, it's when, and we have that with our kids. Something's gonna happen at some point in time. What do we do? And, and we had a fairly passionate conversation about this yesterday um, and previous days as well, because I mean, it feels like a lot of stuff's fragmented. It feels like when shit hits the fan, we don't have a 911 to dial and we don't have a very comprehensive way of doing things. So I'm really interested in the, what the hell do we do when something goes wrong? Chris, if you don't mind, I'm gonna stick this one to you first, just for a whole bunch yeah. of different reasons. Yeah. So there's there's actually um there there's actually some really important techniques with this and and first is you have to realize that the emotions you're feeling are 100 percent good and you have right to feel them but it doesn't mean you have the right to react to them in every way so if you feel uncontrolled anger like uh, angry at my daughter because she did something stupid on the internet that's a time to say hey we're going to talk about this but we're going to do this in 20 minutes and you go away and get your anger out you go punch a wall hit a pillow whatever you do something away from her. That's not what she needs to see or he needs to see at that moment. The, the, most likely, if the child did something really stupid on the internet, got involved in a conversation, sent a picture that he or she shouldn't have sent, got involved in a website that they shouldn't have been involved in, they already feel really stupid. They already feel really taken advantage of. You saying, boy, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen you do, is just going to reconfirm all the negative, horrible feelings about them right there and then. So you may be feeling that, you may be thinking it, never say it. And if you need to say it, go to the room, take your spouse, your significant other, 
you say it there and you're like, okay, now we need to be calm. Now go back out there and give them a hug and let them know you're going to work through them. You're going to work through this with them. You're going to be there for them. You're going to be their support and their rock. And that will go a huge distance in them realizing that, okay, I made a mistake. There's going to be consequences. They don't need to be discussed right now. This is not the moment consequences need to be discussed. Let's first put the fire out. Let's figure it out. If your house was burning, you wouldn't sit there and list all the ways that maybe the fire got started. Who did it? How did it happen? You would put the fire out. You'd make sure your family is safe. You get the dog out of the house. You'd get your most important whiskey out. And then you'd be like, okay, now let's figure out. Hey, man, that's a real thing. Okay. Ask I mean, you get the kids out first, the dog, then you go get the whiskey, right? But then after that, you're like, how do we fix the problem? Okay. Yeah, you may, the order is different, but you know. You would then say, let's fix the issue now and let's figure out what the consequences of that issue are. But primarily, show them that you love them. Show them that your concern for them is real. And that will go a million miles more fixing this this issue than, than yelling and screaming and being angry. Yeah, no, that's huge. I mean, we've, uh, you know, to Gabrielle's point, we put some stuff up on the site. I know you've got some stuff on the site as well. David with the Hack for Kids. I mean, Alma, there's some stuff on the resources. We've got stuff for how to remove images from sites, how to deal with identity theft, how to deal with the financial theft and everything else. And when we've, the mechanisms are there at a technical level and it's gonna suck. I mean, let's be perfectly honest, getting hold of all the different websites to explain to them that it's your kid's picture that's up there and it needs to come down means you're gonna be probably on the phone for a day or two dealing with freaking tech support and everybody else. Hmm. Um, David said yesterday, and I'm cognizant of that time, David said yesterday, you know, depending upon where it is, to almost point earlier, it might be school jurisdiction, you know, that you have to go and deal with the school to deal with the situation and get it dealt with after you've actually gotten everybody out of the house and stuff sorted out. Or it might be you do go deal with the police, you know, you file a report and then you deal with it from there. It depends, especially if it's the cyberbullying side of the world on, you know, it doesn't matter who it's up against, but you deal with it there. There's actually a ton of resources out there. Um, or, you know, let's face it, we're all around and we probably get asked these questions on a daily, if not weekly basis. Hey, X, Y, Z has happened. What do you recommend? Um, mm -hmm. It's, uh, this issue is not going away. I mean, Chris, you, you, the stats at the beginning were freaking horrendous. I wish we could have a more cohesive and comprehensive way of dealing with this. Because, I mean, there's some amazing questions that have come in. Um, to everybody that's still listening, um, we have got the resources up on the Wiser site. I've put the link out there a couple of times. Chris Hagnani's got a bunch of stuff on the ILF site. He's put that up a couple of times. David's got some stuff on the Hank for Kids sites. Alma's on LinkedIn as well. She can be asked. Gabrielle's, we're all out there. We can be asked. I think we'll try to put some more stuff together as well that kind of tries to, to stitch as much of this together as we humanly possibly can. My takeaway from this is really it's our job as parents to educate ourselves, to then pass on as much of that as we can to the educators, to our kids, to our parents and grandparents, and, and we go from there. But again, it's people first, then we rely on technology after we've hit the people problem. Um, I would love some final words. We're at the top of the hour. I just love some final closing thoughts from each one of you, if you don't mind. Alma, please lead us away on the closing thoughts. Uh, well, I would, for my closing thoughts, I think I would invite parents to, again, start this conversation also with schools. Schools have to prepare for emergencies. So to use Chris's metaphor of fire, they do their training for earthquakes, fires, drills. They have those going on. So how about the parents also ask that Schools do this for cyber security issues when it comes to students. That would be my closing thoughts for parents to talk to their teacher, talk to the teachers, talk to schools. Um, our kids spend so much time of their life in schools. So I think this is a really important spot to hit when it comes to keeping our kids safe online. I hope my sound didn't cut out. Yeah, no, that was appreciated. Thank you. Uh, David, please, if you wouldn't mind some closing thoughts. Yeah, real simple. So we've recognized some of the issues. We know there's more. We know that these issues continue to evolve and in some cases get worse, right? Uh, again, those those numbers that Chris was saying before are just 
horrible to hear. It, it, it just kind of makes you crush inside. Um, but, but what my message is, is there's a lot of great organizations out there that are addressing these issues and they're all kind of pulling in their own direction. What we really need to do is start pulling in the same direction together. Yeah, I would agree on that one. Gabrielle, closing thoughts, please, sir. Please start as soon as possible, honestly. You know, people think that, you know, okay, now my teen is, I don't know what they're doing, so I want to monitor them. But if you do this early, as early as possible, and you set the rules in place, the foundation in place, you can trust them later if you did all those things before. Um, so that's my, yeah, that's my biggest advice. Just start as soon as possible. Whenever they get access to the internet, that's when you start to educate them, just like when they cross the street, you tell them to look left and right. That's the age. Appreciate it. Chris, uh, you get to close it out for us, please, sir. Wow, thank you. Um, our children are the most important thing on this planet right now. They are the future. They are the generation that's going to look back on 2020 and go, what the heck just happened? And our job as parents is to teach them how to navigate this world. And that is not just the internet, that is not just the dangers there, it is the world, everything involving it. We have to teach them how to live and be a productive member of society. Yes, educators have a part in that, schools have a part in that, but it is us, it is the parents, it is the guardians, it is our job to do that. And we have to take that seriously. And if that means being uncomfortable, having to teach ourselves new things, having to learn new things, having to ask for help, uh, having to humble ourselves to do that, then we have to do it. We, we have to do it because the predators are doing it. The cyber bullies are doing it. They're educating themselves to make themselves stronger. We have to take this seriously. I know that's a really somber message to end on, but there is absolutely no way that our kids are gonna learn to navigate this successfully if as parents we don't take that initial step to start it early like, like, Gab like Gabrielle said and to be consistent and to be the good example that we want our kids to be. Uh, this, is, this is probably the most important thing that we will do as, as parents in our lives is to teach our kids to be a responsible member of society that is safe and that, that can navigate this world safely. No, I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. All right, so to everybody listening, thank you very, very much for uh, coming to join us. Um, we've put a bunch of questions have been answered, a bunch of resources are out there. Please feel free to reach out to anybody that's on here on this one, to Alma, to Chris, to David, to Gabrielle. Thank you very, very much for joining. Um, hugely appreciated, amazing conversations. And as always, love you guys. Thank you. Take care, stay safe, and appreciate it. And we are done. Take care, yeah, everybody. Chris. Good job. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.